This is October 26, 2004. We're in the home of Robert Goheen, doing the second of a series of interviews on his life and presidency of Princeton University. Is that good? Yes, it is. Okay. We're ready to go. Well, okay. welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by picking up on something we talked about last time, right. which was when you became university president. Right. And can you just tell me a little bit about the shape of the universe? I want to stop for one second while this plane goes right. over our head. Uh, okay, we're rolling. You don't need the date. You need to just begin with your first question. Okay, thank you. So can you tell me a little bit about what shape the university was in when you assumed the presidency? Sure. Well, let me start back at that a meeting in New York that I had with the senior trustees when they invited me to become president. Uh, in the course of that luncheon, uh, Pitney Van Dusen, head of Union Theological Seminary, uh, one of the most uh, senior and uh, I must say powerful Princeton trustees, said to me, Bob, it's just wonderful. The university's in great financial shape and you won't have to spend a lot of time raising money. You can concentrate on education. Well, even as an assistant professor, I knew that that quite wasn't the way things were here. I'd been sh sharing an officer an office with three other assistant professors and an associate professor for about six years, and and we actually ended up doing a lot of our work at the tables in the classical seminar room in the library because we were all on top of each other. And uh, I knew that uh, young faculty and many older faculty too weren't exactly uh, feeling uh, well off. Uh, so I, I, I knew there'd be more to the story <laughs> when I began, be, be, began to look into things as, as president-elect. I, I learned that the administration figured that salary, overall, the salary pool needed to be increased by about two and a half million dollars if we were going to keep the best of our faculty and be competitive, and that there was at least 40 million dollars of deferred maintenance and new building that was needed. So it, was, it wasn't a total shock to me, but it was a, a strange introduction to, to the office. Uh, of course, we then went on. I might say, uh, right after, shortly after the war, all the leading American universities were feeling these same economic pinches, and one didn't know where the money was going to come from uh, for it. And Harvard took the lead and boldly launched a $92 million capital campaign, the first thing of its kind, certainly, in, uh, in our times. And that emboldened us to start to work right away and develop a capital campaign, which I guess we announced sometime in late 58 or early 59 uh, for $53 million, and uh, which we thought was our maximum stretch. In fact, we ended up, after three years and having gotten $61 million, so that was a nice nice plus. And dollars are a very different thing in those days that, than they are now. If you think of $53 million is nothing in the current cur currency, but in the 1950s, it was a hell of a lot of money. Anyhow, the capital campaign went, went very well, and we were able to undertake a very substantial building program because Princeton had, had it added uh, no new facilities of any significance except the Firestone Library and the small Woodrow Wilson School since the Great de de uh, Depression. And virtually every department needed its space renovated and many needed additions. And we were able to develop for the first time a decent art, art museum on campus and 
and a lot got done with that $62 million, $61 million. So I just wanted to go back into that a, a, a little bit. And then if I can keep running on, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Sputnik again. And I really do believe that Sputnik generated in America generally a much renewed and heightened sense of the importance of higher education. And in the next 10 years or so, uh, resources came to the universities that had just been quite out of their reach before, not only from the federal government, but also from found the big foundations and wealthy individuals. Uh, so it, it was, I, I was lucky enough to begin an up, an up rise and be able to participate in, in development rather than just holding the fort and desperately worrying what was going to happen next. Right. Am I understanding you correctly? You think there's a connection between the success of fundraising, the, the $53 million campaign, and Sputnik? I, th I think galvanized in this country a concern, for, certainly for uh, uh, science and engineering, uh, but, but generally for uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's a very indirect connection, but the climate change right, right after that, as far as, 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 as I felt it. Do you think that uh, that also changed the relationship between university and government? Well, it certainly did. I mean, uh, when I became president in 57, uh, I think sponsored research from government, though there was some, was, was not for, certainly not more than $2 million a year, probably much less. Uh, within the next year, we were up around $30 million. Uh, most of it flowing into science and engineering, but some into the social sciences and uh, through Title VI, some even into the humanities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like to pause for one moment so the phone ends. Oh, okay. Okay. You may begin. <laughs> Do you have more to, to add no. to? Okay. Um, you've mentioned the $53 million campaign. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the genesis of the idea? When you became president, was that already talked about? or It was certainly being talked about in Nassau Hall. It, as I said, had not been mentioned to me <laughs> by, <laughs> by the trustees. <laughs> oh, man. And as, a non -in, as an assistant professor, I was not privy to what was being discussed in Nassau Hall. Okay. Um, you s alluded to how the figure was derived in terms of building. Oh, they're quite tr traditionally. On the one hand, you looked around and got each department to assess its needs, and then tried to pick out what the priorities, what seemed. And at the same time, we hired some professional fundraiser, raising group, who made a canvas of the alumni and other potential donors to see what was realistic. And so you wouldn't set our site at 100 million and know we're going to come, come out way short. Uh, so really those were the two elements of it. Do you think there's a particular legacy of the campaign? Oh, yeah. I think, I think that uh, galvanizing the alumni th through, through committees, many of them involved in fundraising, through meetings and publications and whatnot. Uh, the interests of many alumni were refocused on the university in a very healthy way. Do you remember Carlos Baker's book, A Friend in Power? I, and, uh, was a friend, <laughs> Carlos was a friend of mine, so yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, this is supposed to be an account for the search for the president that lend, that ends in your selection. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering, have you read it? And oh, I, mean, I read it 
early on. I don't, <laughs> frankly, don't remember it. But, <laughs> but, uh, I, I knew Carlos very well, both as a faculty member and as a neighbor. You owned that, the house right there at the end of the circle up here. When we last met, um, we were talking a little bit about how different aspects of the university work, speech writing, administration, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Uh, there are some who have told me that during the first part of your presidency that the budget was essentially determined by you, Doug Brown, and Ricardo Mestres. Is that true? And could you uh, elaborate yes, more? Yes, that was, <laughs> but not spun out of our top of our heads. We, <laughs> we, we met with departmental chairman and it, it, uh, <coughs> principal administrators and and went over what their requests were and generally had to peel them down and every now and then he'd say we want to do more in this area than in that area and you know I think that that's true uh, and uh, that was adequate when we were dealing with a budget of about what did I say 18 million dollars. It soon became inadequate. Yeah. How did it evolve? How did what changed? Well, uh, I, I'm just trying to think. Actually, we went on, on that way until about uh, fifty. until about 60, 6 or 7 when the Priorities Committee w was developed. And uh, that development was part of a larger restructuring of the uh, internal administration and communications of the university, but proved to be a very he healthy and useful one. Mm. I might say that in the post-war years, my, the first years of my presidency, though quite a number of the Princeton f faculty d did come to faculty meetings or were somewhat engaged. Basically, the f faculty here and elsewhere were wrapped up in their teaching and their scholarship and were leaving administration to the administration. And when life was simple and there weren't great strains c being felt on the university, that was okay. Uh, I'd always felt, and Princeton indeed had a tradition of trying to, uh, involving faculty and students in various committees, but it was on a very low-key, quiet kind of basis. And so I welcomed it when the Kelly Committee came up with a structure which both formalized and enlarged the participation of faculty, administration, and students uh, in the important decisions of the university, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. As we did last time, uh, can you tell me more about either or both uh, Douglas Brown or Ricardo Mestres, what they were like to work with, what you remember about them? Well, they were both uh, very intelligent, broad-minded, uh, uh, men who care deeply about higher education in general and Princeton in, in particular. Uh, D D D Dean Brown, a deal with the faculty, uh, was almost uh, uh, hipped on Princeton, you say. You couldn't see any other places comparing with us. You <laughs> couldn't see Princeton's faults that some of the rest of us saw. But he's a wonderful, wonderful, other, in other respects, a very judicious uh, and able man. Uh, Dick Mestres was a businessman by temperament, but a very broad-minded one. Uh, he, uh, I think, got along very well with, with the departmental chairman with whom he had to, had to work. I never had people coming and complaining to me about Mestres, except he isn't giving me as much money as I wanted. <laughs> uh, 
It was a very collegial group that we had in Nassau Hall and, and in Nassau Hall's relationship uh, with the faculty, I think. Did uh, a lot of people come to you complaining that they didn't get enough money? Was that a common occurrence? Oh yeah, especially, especially bef before we raised any to give, give out. Absolutely. Switching gears just a little bit, I want to talk about the 1963 riots that okay. you know get a lot of play uh, when you yeah. look over the clippings. Uh, it seemed to me it was a trying period for you as president. Right. And I'm just thinking with the perspective of the years, what do you think was the cause of the disturbance? What are your thoughts about it now? Oh, I, I, the cause of it is very simple. It was a beautiful May night with a full moon. Uh, house parties had just ended. The women who had been by the campus had just left. and. Lots of young guys were feeling like kicking up their heels. It started out as a very innocuous kind of thing, but uh, as mass actions often do, they become frenetic, they become fanatical, and endangered lives on Nassau Street. Some guys rolled a, a truck, a big piece of equipment down Washington Road that could have annihilated, who, who knows, but. But that was that. That's that wasn't the cause of my annoyance. At the same time, in the South, in Birmingham, and other places, young blacks were rioting and or protesting for very important social purposes. And we Ivy Group elitists kicking up our heels this way, and apparently taking it of no account. Uh, it, the idea of it just appalled me, and that, that feeling of frustration and really anger I felt was magnified by an op-ed piece uh, in the New York Times written by John Oakes, a Princeton graduate of class of 36, who was also a friend of mine because we were in the war together. And he said that, you know, boys will be boys. He put this all over the New York Times. And that magnified publicly the, the distinction between these Prince kids doing what they're doing so absolutely thoughtlessly, blindly, and the struggle going on in the South that I thought was so important. Yeah, I got, I got quite angry about that. I'm just wondering that um, years later, when the Vietnam protests began, did you draw any lessons from what happened earlier that you thought applied? Or? No, no, I didn't. Uh, uh, we didn't do anything to change the discipline system or anything before. We just tried to get, get everybody to shape up and go about their ordinary <laughs> business. When the Vietnam protests began, uh, and with them other forms of, sort of anti-social activity or uh, activity hostile to the university rather than people just blowing off steam, uh, of course, it, disciplinary issues became uh, more significant. And we did two things. I uh, was glad to accept the resignation of the then Dean of Students, who was a first-rate fine person, but living in a, in a somewhat bygone age, so far as the current students were concerned, and bring Neil Rudenstein down here to be de Dean of Students as a person who would be jointly, be simultaneously respected by by the faculty as a bona fide academician, mm -hmm. and by the students as a s scholar and a, 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 a teacher and, and dean. And I thought that was a, proved to be a very helpful and 
important step. Mm -hmm. And then later, uh, as I've said, I was entirely for the work of the Kelly Committee uh, setting up new uh, new structures, new ways of dealing with conduct and disciplinary matters. Mm -hmm. Let's discuss uh, co-education a bit. Okay. It's an important part of your legacy. In a 1966 interview, you discussed the possibility of co-education in terms of a coordinate college. Yeah. Um, and then two years later, you form the Patterson Committee. Can you just tell me how your thinking on co-education evolved during the, that time? Well, uh, I, I looked around the society and I, I read the newspapers and I saw that women were playing an increasingly influential role in this world, an increasingly more outspoken one. And it became, to me, belatedly, most people would say, I guess I'd say so too, uh, quite clear that Princeton had fallen behind in this respect. We just were not in touch with this whole segment of our society. Uh, there were going to be influential players in the society. Uh, I had gone along comfortably with a wife and daughters who had gone to Vassar and Bryn Mawr and se seemed happy about their single-sex education, but it, it, that, that was somewhat in the past. Uh, important, too, was increasing evidence uh, that both in private leading private schools, sending students to Princeton and public schools, some of the very ablest of the young people were not applying to Princeton simply because it was not co-educational. And uh, that was an important factor for us. We like to think we're uh, dealing with the future movers and shakers of the country, and for some that just refused to come and be educated here for that reason mm -hmm. uh, was a great shock. So all of, in, in my own thinking, all those things kind of coalesced, yeah. So why did you establish a task force to study co-education? Well, when we when we go back, <laughs> Let me go back to something you said earlier sure. about uh, coordinate or, or co true coeducation. Uh, Yale was flirting with Vassar. Kingman Brewster was trying to get uh, Alan Simpson and the Vassar faculty to become the junior partners of Yale. And that led us to look around and uh, through some people who were, had ties both to Princeton and to Sarah and Lawrence. I had some talks with the people at Sarah and Lawrence about our lashing up together. Well, it proved that, the, that they're just two quite different institutions and there was no, no fit. So then we just turned away from that toward co-education. Then you, I had the question of uh, if this is a good idea uh, for educational reasons as well as uh, other reasons, uh, how do we sell it to all the people who are going to doubt it, and the Board of Trustees and the alumni and the rest? And that's why we put the Patterson, got Pat to take on the development of that report and work with the faculty uh, administrative committee to try to bring it about. One of the other things that floats around in the literature is, um, did you make a pledge to the trustees to maintain the number of men? Yeah. And, <laughs> and we did. But obviously, uh, shortly, within a few years, that changed. Yeah. 
Can you tell but me I what? was not committing Bowen to anything. I mean, I you know, I, I said we could take in up to 600 women without reducing the number of men by building a couple of, uh, well, we'd already begun to build so, some new dormitories, and then we took over the Princeton Inn and made it into a college. So I, I kept my part of that part. <laughs> Good timing there. Yes. Break for a moment. I've, I've been a bit breathing. garrulous then. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm back recording again. Okay. Um, how did you convince the trustees uh, to implement co-education? Well, I, uh, the, the key thing was the Patterson Committee report. Uh, I asked Harold Dodds, the ranking trustee, the chairman of the executive committee, if he would uh, head a committee to study the, the issue of co-education and specifically with attention to the Patterson Report. And Harold said, but I don't believe in it. <laughs> and I said, Harold, I didn't ask you to believe in it. I asked you to study it. <laughs> and he picked up the ball and he did. He led that committee. And uh, uh, they they thought and argued and considered hard, I must say. I'll go back and say that for, for the trustees who favored co-education, I think except those who had children in college and whatnot, most of them took on faith what we said that was educationally beneficial, that enriched the educational experience of the men as well as of the women. But what it was telling with all of them was the clear fact that we are not getting from Deer Trice High School up there or Westminster School out at Atlanta uh, the cream of the crop of their students. They were just going to Yale, Harvard, and MIT. Uh, and that was a very compelling factor. Mm. In retrospect, is there anything w you wish you could have done differently or that you wish you knew when you started on the process? I, I hate to sound like President Bush because I think <laughs> things went uh, well. I think they went faster and better than I expected them to. <laughs> um, did you see any impact of co-education on annual giving or other alumni? Uh, there there was virtually no impact and pretty soon annual giving started to take off. I mean, uh, when I became president, I think slightly over mil one million dollars a year was coming in through annual giving. And by the time I left, it was over three, three, three and a, or close to three and a half million, I think. I don't have these figures very firmly in mind. There's no doubt that there was a very vociferous opposition to co-education oh, sure. among a section of the alumni. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, what sort of problems did that cause for you, both as president and, and also personally as an alum yourself? <laughs> Hours of telephone call, writing, writing letters, and uh, one of the papers uh, you've seen indicated within the administration we had some very strongly, and especially in the development side of the administration, some very strongly opposed, uh, loyal and, and fine young, young or not all young, Princetonians. Uh, but uh, their voice was simply outweighed by the others. Mm. You mentioned um, Gardner Patterson, mm -hmm. and again, can you just give me your reflections on him? What was he like to work with? Uh, well, uh, why did you choose Gardner, him? Gardner was a relatively young professor of international finance. And I got to know him before the presidency because there used to be in the Firestone Library, in the 
mezzanine above a faculty lounge and what is now st all stacks on the third floor, a, a little cafe. And Gardner worked up in that area and I was often, that's where the classics reading room is. And a wonderful place where you sat down and met with people from many different disciplines and formed friendships or even not friendships sometimes. <laughs> uh, so I'd known him and thought well of him. And then when we came to this question of getting this kind of study and report done, uh, I was talking with really Bill Bowen was the one who said, well, he thought Pat would be interested in doing it and would do it very well. And I think he was on leave at that time. Uh, he came back when he finished his leave and really pitched into it and did a very thorough and good job. So he, Gardner Patterson went by Pat? Yeah, uh, that was his nickname, yeah. Also with admissions, can you tell me a little bit about when race became a consideration and, and how diversing, diversifying the university became one of sure. your priorities? Well, I, I, Dan can't fully remember what I've said before in this interview, but uh, I think I confess that through most of my life until the early 60s, 61, 62, I had been lar largely oblivious to the issue of race in this country. It just wasn't the thing I'd been exposed to or had had to grapple with or, or thought much about. And then as these reports started to come out of the South about uh, civil rights activities there and the reactions to them, uh, some of that preceded that time, but it all accumulated there in the early 60s, 61 to 3. Uh, I, one couldn't avoid it, or I couldn't avoid it. And we also had some students who spent, had graduate students and undergraduate who'd given up time to work in the civil rights movement there. and I came to know them or they came to see me and I did get ver very much involved in it and it led me to uh, try to see we, that we could do our, our utmost to get increase the racial diversity of the Princeton campus. Not easy because as we found out uh, uh, of blacks who might academically be eligible, uh, many were turned away from Princeton because of his reputation as having been a place which rejected black, and not the least because of Woodrow Wilson's uh, activity as president in denying the blacks uh, entry into the civil service. Uh, <laughs> That was a shocker. Wilson had, to me, always been a hero. And it was up until this time and suddenly I learned about what he'd done with respect to the blacks in Washington. And I, it, I, it was clear he, just, he was a Southern racist. There's no doubt about that. So you felt Wilson's legacy even 50 years later? Yeah. What specific steps did you do to try and diversify the, the student body? Well, we asked the admi admissions officers, I guess Alda Dunham was the uh, director of admissions at that time, to really make an effort as they travel the country to reach into places where there might be qualified black applicants. Uh, we tried to get our few, our few black students, I guess they weren't more than eight or ten of them, uh, to be, uh, to, to talk well about Princeton, be receptive to possible applicants. Some of them were and some of them weren't. 
and importantly, uh, uh, we brought in a Carl Fields from NYU to join the dean of the college's office, and uh, in short order, he became an assistant dean, the first black dean in the Ivy Group, I might say. And Carl was a wonderful man. He could understand what the university was about before, and he could understand uh, grievances and fears and concerns of the black students. And and he could somehow understand the blindness of we white people to some of that experience. He's a great uh, communicator and facilitator and became a very good personal friend. You also mentioned Alden Dunham. Did yeah. you work much with him? Can you talk about him? I didn't, I, I never had close personal relations with Alden. He did, did I thought, a, a, a workman-like job as dean of admissions and was quite professional about it. And uh, uh, Alden's not a warm person. He's a, a somewhat buttoned-up person. Uh, but uh, uh, he was never a problem for me, and I hope I wasn't one for him. Related to this, can we discuss the eating clubs a little bit yeah. and the problems in the late 1950s that yeah. they suffered? Uh, what's your view on the controversy of the clubs and the, um, the anti-Semitic uh, issues of 1958 in yeah. particular? Well, let me say that uh, not only as a former club member and club president, uh, but in general, I think the clubs have and, sh and should have uh, a, a useful, beneficial place in the Princeton scheme of things. Uh, the trouble is largely is that they become uh, too absorptive of, of undergraduate interest and attention. Uh, now, going back in the history, it's interesting that uh, because during World War II, these clubs had all been paying taxes to the borough on the property, at the end of the war, they were nearly stripped financially. So they began to reach out for bigger memberships, not black, but just bigger memberships than they'd had before. And it got to the point where pretty soon, it must have been in the, in the late 40s, they were, they were achieving 100% bigger. They were getting every student who wanted to get into a club into a club. And that was a great undergraduate achievement. Uh, <laughs> they didn't know the under, economic basis of it, but anyhow, <laughs> it was a great achievement. Uh, by 1957, uh, that effort to get 100% had just worn itself out, I think. And what was some 57 uh, students did not get uh, ad ad admitted to any club despite the efforts of the Inter-Club Committee. Uh, it turned out that a high proportion of them were Hebrews. And that, of course, uh, raised the cry of anti-Semitism at Princeton and whatnot. That was one of the first crosses I had to bear, bear as president. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was no fun. Uh, <coughs> well, as, we, as a uh, consequence of that, almost immediate consequence of that, a group of sophomore leaders I guess for the next year, uh, said we're not going to go. We're not going to bid for the clubs. We want the university to help us find some other alternative. And thus was generated what I guess was initially called. Uh, uh, I think it was called the Madison Society. 
because they ate in the old commons, Madison Hall, the freshman commons. And um, Bobby Hillier, this distinguished architect, was a leader of that group. And they're a wonderful group of young people with whom I uh, sided 100%. And I think I told you I had said to the trustees before I was president that I was concerned about the social situation on Prospect Street, thought it needed attention, more attention. Well, that, in a sense, with the backing of what the undergraduates were doing, the Hillier group and what we were doing, uh, we were able to put the pressure on uh, to authorize the development of new, dor new dormitories and a new social facility, namely Wilcox Hall, and right now it's Wilson College. And so uh, that, that developed. It was, and it, it, it was never it never drew as much of the undergraduate body as I would have hoped, but it still was an, a worthwhile development. Uh, later on, I guess before all the dormitories were new dormitories were finished, we had a couple of other ex expedients. We had a group eating on the in the cafeteria at the top of. New South, which is also called the Madison Society. Uh, and still later, I, I guess a couple of years later, uh, because uh, two of the clubs had gone out of business, uh, university acquired them and converted them and, and, and established their what we call Stevenson Hall, mm -hmm. Hall, which was a, a eating and dining place, uh, like the clubs, but with no admissions, no, no bicker, no admissions qualifications. It included graduate students who wanted to, as well as undergraduates, and uh, was a very important safety valve for a while for us. As an outsider looking at the clubs, it yeah. seems like through much of the 20th century, there's always issues that come up uh, that are are yeah. problematic. During your tenure, did you see anything else besides the late 50s uh, episodes? Well, there's a certain degree of anti-intellectualism uh, in some of the clubs. Uh, they always prided themselves on it, uh, which was always troublesome to us. And we tried to encourage clubs to have faculty fellows as, as guests and visitors to eat with them when they felt like it and talk with them. Some cases that worked very well, in other cases not at all. Really depend upon the personality of the faculty member and the club leadership. Earlier you had mentioned um, Kingman Brewster, yeah. who is of course another legendary college president. Mm -hmm. How much um, interaction did you have with him over your tenure? Well, Margaret and I got to know King Kingman and Mary Ellen Brewster uh, very well, uh, not only through the meetings of the American Association of Universities, to which we both our universities belong, uh, or in the Ivy Group President's meeting, but there was a nice tradition that I inherited in those days that in the weekends of the Harvard Yale Princeton games, the visiting uh, teams president and wife came and stayed with the host president and wife. So we first got to know the Grizzles from Yale that way and then Kingman and so on. In turn, we would stay, visit up there when Princeton played up there. And uh, uh, then from time to time, if you had a particular issue or problem, 
pick up a phone you knew, already know came and you say, King, what's got, what are you people doing about this? Here's what, <laughs> what we're trying to do about it. He was a very imaginative, able, uh, highly intelligent uh, person whose ideas I sometimes thought were screwy, but nevertheless he, he was a dynamo, he, he was a kinetic person. Can you think of any specific issues that you consulted uh, with him? And you did pick up the phone? Yeah, he tried, he tried to sell. <laughs> no, I tried to pick up the phone. Either way. It would have had to do with, uh, uh, the only one I can think about um, would have been 60, late, late, late mid, mid, mid 60s, when there was a trial of a, uh, of a black going on at New Haven, uh, which drew protesters from all over the place. And uh, a number of our Princeton graduate students particularly uh, became involved in that. And I, 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 had no, I had no answers to offer King Will. I wanted to let him know that, that some of our guys were up there and I resented it and regretted it. Uh, but most of them are, are smaller things, changes in Ivy Group policy or stuff like that. Were there other Ivy League presidents that you had that type of relationship with? Oh yeah, to, to a considerable degree with uh, the Puseys, Nathan and Pusey. Though, though Nathan Pusey's a much more reserved person than Kingman. But yes, we, we, we did and uh, later with Jim Perkins at, at Cornell when he became president of Cornell. How would you describe Perkins? Oh, indescribable. <laughs> Fellow of ma 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 many talents. Oh, very strong Quaker values. Oh, yeah, yeah. A mover and shaker. Jim, li Jim liked to get things done, uh, influence things. I, he, was, he was more impetuous and more self-confident than I was in that respect. <laughs> and then I'm just wondering a little bit about town-gown relationships while you were president. Can you characterize them in any way? It's a big, it's a big, big topic. Uh, I have to again. I start with a, a mea culpa. Uh, I was so tied up in trying to be a good president for the first years in office that I never thought about the town. And it was, as you would say, in my watch in the early 60s that the borough council put in that urban renewal thing that destroyed Jackson Street and all the black housing along it and create what we now know as Paul Robeson Place. Now that was a terrible piece of social engineering which has helped to keep this town riven ever since between the black community and and I, I, I just was oblivious to it again. Uh, later, as we started to get complaints, mainly because of what university building might or might not be doing to affect the rest of the town, I became aware that you had to deal with it, town fathers, and I got to know the mayor pretty well and, and all. Uh, I wrote a little pamphlet at some point on uh, town gown relations in which I compared Princeton to being the 
fat boy in the canoe that every little movement he made shook the whole boat. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't think of them being, uh, the relations being uh, hostile. I think, we, I think they were just kind of neutral as far as I was concerned. There must have been more vibrations than that because uh, Bud Vivian, Leslie Vivian, uh, we appointed to be concerned with town and state relations. We'd never had anybody doing that before. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, Mr. Vivian? Well, um, Bud was a, a, a member, I think, probably at one point, president of the class of 42, so he's close to me in age. And he came back after the war to join the administration. And uh, he and his wife, Tita, and Margaret and I became and remained all our lives very good friends. Uh, he was a, basically a, a very loyal, hard-working, clear-headed uh, uh, individual. Uh, and I just looked on him as a, as a splendid servant of the university. You know? Well, I think we've reached a, a good stopping point okay. because the other questions I have will take more than the time we have uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to, to answer. But I have one question, uh, oh. and, and no, no, it doesn't uh. have to be on, and depending on what your answer is. <laughs> and Dan asked you, can you give an example? Right before Dan said, for example, picking up the phone, you started to say a sentence that sounded like you were going to say that Kingman tried to sell you something. Was it on yes. an idea, or was it a thing? No. He had this idea that you can start to mar market it, uh, admissions and by uh, students really taking out loans, uh, which they would repay as alumni. And you'd use that. It's not just the kind of loan schemes we have, where that's on, but this would become a basic financing device for the university. And uh, my friends who know more about money than I, like Ricardo Mestres and others, thought it was a fruity idea. <laughs> and uh, so I, 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 I did too. You could never really sell it for a place like that. So you would take a loan out as an undergrad and then repay it for yeah, the rest of your sure. life, essentially? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, the permanent I, student I, I, loan. <laughs> this, uh, I don't know if either of you have seen it. There's a book that came out about two years ago, a year and a half ago, called The Guardians. It was written by a Yale PhD in history with a long European, Central European name that I don't have with me. But he takes up Kingman Brewster, McGeorge uh, Bundy, uh, Bill Bundy, uh, Elliot Richardson, uh, those four particularly, as Yale alumni, Yale students and Yale alumni, who got a terrific sense that they were the guardians of the American tradition. And uh, 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 it's, it's, it's a long and complex book, so but it, it, what struck me is I've never thought of Princeton producing guardians. I thought it was producing servants. <laughs> it's quite, quite a different, different thing. <laughs> Thank you for Good. catching that. Thank you, because I, I was dying to know what it was he tried to sell <laughs> you. <laughs>